Study engineering, help us lead a green revolution, developing new sources of clean energy that will power our economy and preserve our planet. come up with trading regulations and you cannot have the, can I say, United Nations, and you cannot just have them come up with environmental regulations. They should actually sit down and ensure that trade regulations and environmental regulations do not restrict trade in developing countries. At the same time, do not favor developed countries as well. 
So the question is, should developing and developed countries be subject to the same trade regulations? Well, I think no. First of all, we have to look at the world population in numbers. At least two thirds of the members of the World Trade Organization belong to the class of developing countries. So ideally, I think it would be unfair to expect these countries to trade at the same rules. Um, to give you the example of, say, cotton farming, um, um, West African producers of cotton have to fight their so-called internal barriers to trade, mostly lack of infrastructure and organization, and then to be able to produce co um, cotton, which will be exported to, say, um, countries they require. On the other hand, you have developing countries such as the US and EU countries who give farmers subsidies that ensure that the cost of production is kept as low as possible. So we have two types of cotton products in the market. You have the cheap products from these developed countries and then you have the not so cheap products from developing countries. Do you expect them to trade equally in the market? No, it does not make sense. So that's where we have kind of like that's where the rules and regulations that favor these developing countries come in. We know that um, the percentage returns that actually do get goes back to the farmers that producers are not as fair as expected and then really adequate research hasn't be actually been done into the, can I say, the fairness or the equity of fair trade. So that's another problem on its own side. And then it actually raises up these issues of environmental regulations and developing countries and developed countries should they be treated equally when it comes to the issues of climate change. Well, I would say yes and I would say no. Why? Uh, we could start off and say on the back on the framework of the United Nations conference, which um, where Agenda 21 comes out and talks about the fact that well, developed countries are actually responsible for the issue, or rather for pumping over 200 years of carbon emission, carbon CO2 into the atmosphere. So to say that, given equal rules regarding um, carbon CO2 reduction would be unfair and that was what was agreed at the conference. So what has happened now is that the, the developed countries that do have this, can I say, they have this responsibility to, to reduce their carbon emissions, actually now move their pollution industries to developing regions. So the issue is not that, it's what happens is now like you're reducing the CO2 emissions, you're just moving them around from say the north to the south and that it's not, I don't think there's a solution to any problem. I'm an atheist. I didn't believe in God when uh, the church or my parents would try to convince me. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to believe what these anthropologists have to say uh, just because they've got a degree on their wall, you know? It doesn't make any sense. We must also face the fact that progress towards other goals that were set has not come nearly fast enough. Not for the hundreds of thousands of women who lose their lives every year simply giving birth. Not for the millions of children who die from the agony of malnutrition. Not for the nearly one billion people who endure the misery of chronic hunger. This is the reality we must face. That if the international community just keeps doing the same things the same way, we may make some modest progress here and there, but we will miss many development goals. That is the truth. With 10 years down and just five years before our development targets come due, we must do better. Um, you know, it's one of those things that looks good on paper, you know, it's like a communism or a 12 note composition, you know, it, it looks good on paper, uh, but ultimately it doesn't work. As a person, uh, it doesn't matter what I've tried to do, the only thing that people see and the only thing that matters is what I did, you know, what I've achieved. And if you look at what development has achieved, it's failed us. I'm not a follower of Kant. Intentions aren't important when it comes to judging my life or my legacy uh, 
And so we've got to apply the same rules to judging development. Uh, whilst it has excellent intentions, looking at what it's achieved, it's ultimately failed. I don't agree with capitalism. Uh, I wouldn't say <laughs> there's a capitalist bone in my body, but I can see why it makes sense. And I can see why it can be useful as a tool uh, for protecting the environment. Because once you recognize that nature and the resources that it provides have their own value, you can slot them into the capitalist market and you can give society and everyone in it a reason to protect that nature. And I think that's what we need to start doing. Development has failed. Development is an illusion. It's like you would see a mirage in the desert, you know, something very enticing uh, that you want to grab hold of, but it isn't transient, you know, your hand will go straight through it. Uh, it's not something real. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a fault with development as such. Uh, maybe it's uh, Western philosophy, maybe it's capitalism or our, uh, the markets or our bad habits or greed or uh, anything like that. Uh, but it still has failed. Uh, it's not something that we've ever done successfully. And whenever you put development into reality, the two can't exist, you know, it fails. But there is one element of development that we can still protect and that we can still um, make headway with, that we can still push for, uh, and that's the development of nature. You know, natural development is the only form of development that's worth anything at all. Uh, and that's because of the value of nature. A lot of people don't see that or recognize nature as being valuable. Um, what you can say though is that, as a fact, there is one nature on this earth, and it's in a bad state at the moment. Uh, you know, it's critically ill as a result of the actions that we've taken and the development that we've pushed forwards with. Um, as a resource in itself, is still helping the very poorest of this world, more so than any development ever could. Um, nature itself has its own capital. If you apply it to sort of the capitalist system, it has its own value as a resource. Of course it does. Uh, you know, uh, you can't sort of measure uh, the value to a subsistence farmer in, you know, the number of skyscrapers that his village has. You know, you have to measure it in the number of trees or the number of fields that are producing food for him. Um, you know, and when I try to explain this theory to anthropologists or uh, cultural historians, uh, they'll look at me as if I'm crazy, you know, um, and tell me that, that doesn't make sense. And, you know, I'm an imperialist or I'm a colonialist or, or something like that. Some in wealthier countries may ask, with our economy struggling, so many people out of work, and so many families barely getting by, why a summit on development? And the answer is simple. In our global economy, progress in even the poorest countries can advance the prosperity and security of people far beyond their borders. When a young entrepreneur can't start a new business, it stymies the creation of new jobs and markets in that entrepreneur's country, but also in our own. When millions of fathers cannot provide for their families, it feeds the despair that can fuel instability and violent extremism. Uh, so let's say, for example, uh, you were a poor farmer uh, or a community of farmers uh, uh, deep, deep in the rainforest. Uh, you're not relying on uh, the markets or the economy or stocks and shares to provide for your family. What you're relying on is nature by itself. You need that to survive, to put food on your plate, and to feed your family. Uh, uh, the only positive impact that we can have for those communities is to ignore development and to just protect their natural environment, because that's ultimately what feeds them. I mean, if you imagine, say, uh, that you were a poor farmer in a village, you're not going to be looking to the economy or stocks and shares for survival, you're going to be looking 
at what you can use around you about uh, you know the fields and the forests and the natural environment that puts food on your plate and that feeds your family because that's ultimately the only thing that's valuable to you. And so if we want to develop those communities, that has to be our baseline, that has to be where we start developing their natural environment so that they can lead a healthy, happy and sustainable lifestyle. And that's because nature knows best, you know, nature ultimately is more important than humans and it's, it's older than humans, you know, and nature was here long before us, so we're relatively young in that respect as a race uh, and nature will still be here long after we've ceased to exist. Uh, not just by generation, but by species, uh, humanity as a whole, you know. Uh, maybe in a, a thousand, ten thousand years, the Earth will look very, very different to us, but nature will still live on, it will still be there. And so I think it's important to recognise that we have a responsibility to that nature, maybe even ethically more so than you do to your fellow man, you know. Uh, they say that you have to sort of uh, treat your neighbour very well, but maybe it's perhaps more important to treat nature very well because that's the ultimate presence that we have a responsibility for. If you're looking for sort of positive steps that you can take, I think it's, it seems obvious to me that everyone has to be vegan. And that just seems like a baseline or, or at the very least vegetarian because these are the kind of positive steps that we can start to take to reduce our impact. Um, on the environment and on the world. Um, you know, this kind of sustainable lifestyle that we all need to leave is what's going to allow us to leave nature to live on as it should without our damaging virus-like impacts that we're currently taking on nature and that we're currently having on nature. And ultimately, that's something that we need to protect more than protecting the idea of developing the economy for those people. We just need to protect the nature and the food that actually feeds them hand to mouth as they live every day. Okay, cool. Well, between the two, you should hopefully have something to piece together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was really cool. Yeah. Was it? I liked that ending, yeah. Just leave it like that. It was good. How do you <laughs> stop this?